As for the challenge with Proposition 8 and Hollingsworth v. Perry, the plaintiffs are challenging the constitutionality of California's Prop 8, which, like DOMA, defined marriage between a man and a woman. Also, like DOMA, the California government has defined or has declined to defend Proposition 8, and instead it is being defended by the proponents of the law. The plaintiffs in Perry argue that not only does the law deny equal protection, but also the fundamental right to marry. The Ninth Circuit made a narrow holding that the law was unconstitutional because it took away the right, a right once organized in California, the right to marry. A decision from the Supreme Court on these cases is expected in late June. In the meantime, the country is awaiting a decision on the civil rights issue of our time. So today, we're happy to host uh, Dean Catherine Smith and Susanna Polboat, who's a professor here. Um, they're going to discuss the recent oral arguments and their particular work with the three cases. Uh, Dean Smith, as many of you know, teaches same-sex equal protection law here at the law school, um, along with torts and employment law. Uh, she was a visiting scholar at the UCLA Law, law School Williams Institute, which is a leading research think tank related to legal issues affecting LGBT people. Uh, she's written extensively about the rights of same-sex partners and their children. Uh, Pro Professor Polvo works in the DU Bar's uh, Bar Success Program and has been a guest lecturer for the same-sex equal protection class. Uh, she has written and researched extensively about equal protection jurisprudence related to same-sex couples. Uh, her work has been published in the Fordham Law Review, the Stanford Law Review Online, and the Maryland <coughs> Law Review. Um, so together, and this is kind of why we have this, they both filed an amicus brief in the Windsor case, um, detailing the effect that I have specifically on children of same-sex couples. So we'll turn this over to you. Yes. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for being here um, and for trying to talk about the uh, uh, it's really, it's really great to have a large audience to be able to talk about these issues. So we are going to try to move very quickly through our presentation piece so that we can answer questions from you. And after presenting, if something's not clear, don't raise your hand. We don't want you to you know, set up your questions just because you're up here talking. So what I'm going to do is set out some of the background for the two marriage challenges, marriage equality challenges that are before the court right now. Um, and then turn it over to Professor Smith, who's going to go into more detail about specifically what we argued in our amicus brief and how it fits into um, how it fits into the decision the court might make in these cases. So, how many of you have taken study of equal protection law? Okay, okay, so we roughly half of you. Um, so, this is just kind of a primer on what the big issues are in both of these cases, um, and, and sort of mapped out against the backdrop of uh, the court's existing equal protection doctrine. And so if you all recall from study of protection or other areas of constitutional law, the big question is what level of scrutiny is going to apply, right? Which, which level of scrutiny the court will choose to apply in a given case. And why does that matter? Am I know why that matters so much? Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> I know your name, so you're in trouble. Sure. Um, it matters because the higher level of scrutiny, the more likely, or the less likely. I'm sorry, the more likely the case is. Okay. So, basically, not all equal protection claims are created equal. The majority of claims are subject to very deferential review, which is called rational basis review, and overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, the plaintiffs lose under that standard. So, if you're returning for a plaintiff in an equal protection case, you want to do everything you can to try to get heightened scrutiny. And of course, that's what the advocates of marriage equality payments have done here. They've advocated um, for some form of heightened scrutiny. But so the, in any way, if you get heightened scrutiny, most of the time, the plaintiff is going to end up winning, right? Because it's much more demanding in terms of what the government has to show to defend the discrimination. So, you know, in a sense, and I think the traditional way of looking at what's at issue in marriage equality cases is that it's all about the level of scrutiny. And that's where the real fight is. And once that's decided, um, the result is sort of a foregone conclusion. I think that dynamic is shifting a little bit, but I'll talk about that in a minute. So essentially, um, this maps out the levels of scrutiny. So if you have a, what's called a suspect classification, like race um, or fundamental right, the court will apply strict scrutiny. 
And common method of formulation is a strict scrutiny. The logic has to be narrowly tailored to sort of compelling state interest. You know, we don't necessarily know what those those um, adjectives and adverbs mean. What we do know is that under strict scrutiny, as well as high scrutiny, the burden is on the government. And the more I look at these cases in the state protection law, the more I think that's actually the key part of heightened scrutiny, right? Is the government has to come forward and say, this is the purpose that the law is meant to serve, and this is how the classification serves that purpose, okay? So, uh, and then, quasi suspect classification, there are two of them, gender and non-marital status. Um, uh, and that triggers something called intermediate scrutiny. The burden is still on the state. Uh, and the nature of the relationship of the weighing of the state interest is slightly lesser. If you were to ask me to define the exact difference between a compelling state interest and an important state interest, I don't think I can do so. Uh, but these are some sort of magic words you know, that the court invokes in, in deciding these cases. And then finally, if you have no suspect classification, you have no closet suspect classification, you have no fundamental right, then you're in rational basis for you land. Okay? And again, it's extremely deferential uh, typically. Um, and the most important piece, in my view, is that the burden shifts with plan. And what the plaintiff has to prove is a negative. The plaintiff has to prove that the, even though the order of the work in terms of how it's stated, First, has to prove that there's no conceivable legitimate state interest that this law serves. Okay, and that means that there, the state has absolutely no burden to even present evidence that the law is justified, that the discrimination is justified. Um, the court can sit back on the day that it decides the case and say, "Oh, well, maybe the legislature was thinking about this when it enacted this discriminatory law, or maybe they were thinking about that." It's the plaintiff's job to eliminate all those potential speculative bases. So you can imagine how difficult it is and why plaintiffs have a hard time under this level of scrutiny. So in terms of mapping this onto the marriage equality discussion, um, if you want to get strict scrutiny, you're going to argue that these laws discriminate on the basis of a suspect class, right? And that suspect class is sexual orientation. Problem, these laws say nothing about sexual orientation on their face. There's no terminology, there's no language in there that refers to sexual orientation. And that's an inference that the law is discriminating on the basis of sexual orientation drawn from the assumption that people who want to marry each other are sexually attracted to each other or have a sexual orientation that corresponds to their partner choice. But if you look at the bare language of the statute, there's nothing there about sexual orientation. So you kind of have two hurdles to overcome. You have to show the classification of sexual orientation and that that is a suspect classification. And you guys remember, you have to show the number of factors, right? You have to show a group of historic that they're discriminated against. Not too difficult to prove in the case of a case of um, You have to show that this group is politically powerless. That's a much tougher call. It's the biggest question in this area to put in. A much tougher call after the last election cycle because you had victories for gay rights in many states. Um, and then there's also the um, immutability factor. Not clear why this should be relevant to the court's equal protection jurisprudence at all, in my view. Um, but you know, the idea is that the characteristic that defines the group has to be immutable, an accident of birth, and a sense of something that's not their fault. So you could have the court coming out and making a ruling about whether sexual orientation is a trait, an inherent trait, or a choice. I find that be very, very scary that the court might rule on that because that's kind of, you know, a complicated social issue. Uh, fundamental right, okay? This, these laws regulate marriage. It seems patently obvious that they implicate the fundamental right to marriage, and the fundamental right to marriage that was recognized in other cases of Virginia and other cases. What's the argument that they don't implicate the fundamental right? Anyone know? Yes. That marriage isn't a fundamental right? So marriage is acknowledged as a fundamental right. So by Loving versus Virginia and some other cases. So there's a different there's a different way of framing it. Yes. I guess the issue would be that the marriage that was recognized as a fundamental right is marriage between a man and a woman. Right. Okay. So the idea of fundamental rights is that they're traditional rights, they're well founded in history, 
And you know, the argument on the other side is, well, marriage has always been about a heterosexual union, so it can't possibly be that same-sex couples can lay claim to that particular right. Um, another avenue that I think has been kind of ignored um, is the question of, you know, there are facial classifications on the basis of gender in these laws. You cannot prohibit same-sex marriage without invoking classification of male and female. Sex discrimination against intermediate scrutiny seems like an open shut case, but they're kind of arguing as well. Um, then there's a very interesting issue about rational basis review, and I'm not going to belabor the point, but just to say that there is not one rational basis review. Instead, the court has articulated and applied rational basis review in many different ways throughout um, its precedent. And Romer versus Evans, you guys know that case? That's a strong rational basis review case. Plaintiffs can win under strong rational basis review, sometimes called rational basis with might or heightened rational basis review. Um, weak rational basis review, again, is really applying the standard to the letter and it's very difficult for plaintiffs to prevail under that standard. Okay? So any questions about this basic backdrop and how the issues it raises in this case? Or these two cases, rather. Okay, so what's going on with these cases? We have a really nice summary of, of the cases um, at the outset of our session today. I just wanted to highlight a couple of things. So they both deal with bans against um, same-sex marriage. But there are actually these two cases are quite different in interesting ways, um, and similar in interesting ways. So obviously, the main difference, the parent case involves Proposition 8, which is a state law. Okay? Why does that matter? <coughs> because the states have traditionally regulated the institution of marriage. It's not sort of per se unusual for the state to decide who can and cannot enter into the institution of marriage. Um, and the because it was passed by popular referendum, you have another issue in the case that really doesn't exist in the, in the Lindsay case, which is, are you going to allow the people of California to harness the democratic process to achieve, you know, to express themselves, to achieve an outcome they find desirable? If you strike down Proposition are you kind of undercutting the democratic process? Um, the, and, and so when you look at the, the Windsor case by comparison in terms of Marriage Act, federal law, and act by Congress, and very unusual law. Congress, uh, or the federal government, typically says states, however you define marriage, common law marriage, divorce, whatever, we just accept that. We're going to simply overlay federal rules on top of that and not interfere with how you define marriage, right? So it's unprecedented for the court to come in and say, or rather for the, for the federal government to come in and say, we are now, you know, we have all these state definitions of marriage, and now we're going to add another distinct definition on top of that. And that's where, especially if you read the uh, oral argument transcript from Windsor, that's where the court's talking about federalism, right? Um, why is the federal government getting involved in the state's business? It's a totally different type of argument than an argument on embarrassing. Um, both cases, both law and rather, were sort of backlash laws, okay? So Proposition 8, was enacted in response to California's Supreme Court decision under the California Constitution that same-sex couples have to be allowed the right to marry. So you have the Supreme Court um, declaring that as a matter of law, boom, turn around, next election cycle, you have Proposition 8 on the ballot, okay? Similarly, the DOMA, uh, the Hawaii Supreme Court had not ruled, but had suggested that equal protection principles might require recognition of same-sex marriage. Boom, you have the Sense Marriage Act being passed. Okay? Um, so it's definitely an interesting study in the back and forth between you know, democratic and direct democracy, legislative bodies, and the courts, and sort of different values and views being expressed. Um, in both cases, the executive branch said, we're not interested in defending this law any further. Okay? Um, and that creates some, a number of problems. Um, the, the big question is whether the two groups that have stepped in have standing to defend these laws on appeal. I think this question is very differently situated as between uh, Perry and Windsor. In Windsor, you know, they granted it, they, had, they, they uh, asked if he was a Harvard Law professor to file a brief, an amicus brief on the standing issue. They had a separate argument on standing. 
not the case in Perry. Um, and in Perry, two things that are important. Um, and the, the whole point of the initial referendum process is for the people to be able to circumvent the government. So if the people enact the law, and then the government says, we're just not going to defend it, that purpose is for that um, mission is defeated, right? So that's different as between the Windsor case and the Perry case. Well, secondly, the, we have a California Supreme Court decision saying under California law, the proponents of Proposition 8 have standing. So there is a state law basis for finding Article 3 standing that is completely absent in the Windsor case. Okay? I think it's much more likely the Windsor case might be decided on standing. Um, and then the other interesting similarity, um, in both cases you have explicit sort of anti-gay sentiments in the record, so to speak. So in the um, campaign literature surrounding Proposition 8, you have anti-gay statements. And then in the um, congressional record, uh, surrounding the passage of DOMA, I mean, the Congress comes out and says, this is, this is an expression of moral disapproval of homosexuality. Which in 2013, you think, well, that seems kind of stupid for them to say that. 1996, moral disapproval of homosexuality was still a valid basis for law. That did not change until 2003 and the war at first effect decision. So the other interesting similarity, okay, so but this slide might not come up right now. The other interesting similarity is that um, the, the parties defending the laws in both cases, so proponents of Proposition 8 and Black, the bipartisan legal advocacy group um, in, the, in the Windsor case, both of them are claiming, and they're briefing on this, that one of the reasons why this law is valid um, is because the respective laws are valid is because they promote responsible procreation and child rearing. Okay, so, and Professor Smith can explain this as well, but the idea being that by excluding same-sex couples from marriage, you make marriage uh, more attractive and desirable. And so heterosexual couples who would otherwise procreate outside of marriage will become married prior to procreating. Um, so one <laughs> so side of my they're really a tough spot. They were really in a tough spot in terms of that being their lead argument. So when we got together um, and saw that this is one of the arguments really resonated with Professor Smith's work that she'd done previously, and so we decided to write an amicus brief on this topic. All right, so I'm going to try and uh, get through this relatively quickly. I want to make sure I get, I want to hear from you guys. What, what are you thinking and what sorts of questions uh, you have about this? Um, so I might overlap a little bit, a little bit with Professor Fulwell, but I'm just going to kind of go through the history a little bit here for you. Um, I've been writing about the rights of kids of same-sex couples for the last three years, um, and uh, outside the context of DOMA, uh, and more in the context of uh, outside the context of marriage, even. Uh, so. There are now 25 to 30 states that have, still have absolutely no legal protections for gays and lesbians. Um, we're talking a lot about Perry, we're talking a lot about marriage, uh, but the reality is people think we've come really far, but to tell you the truth, I get really frustrated with the debate around marriage because there are still 25 to 30 states where there are no legal protections for gays and lesbians, it's not even talking about the concept of marriage, okay? And so I um, was on the treadmill one day uh, and I like to joke that because it's not enough pain that I'm running on the treadmill that I'm running, first of all. <laughs> uh, and then I'm on the treadmill. Uh, I was reading Shimarinsky's Hornbook. Uh, <laughs> I know, what a lot of And I came across, I was reading the equal protection section and I came across these non-marital status cases and realized that, wow, like, this means that my child, who is eight, might have a heightened level of protection, like you saw before, more so than my than her two moms, uh, right? Because she really is being subject to discrimination because it's impossible for her parents to get married. And so we'll I'll talk about those non-marital status cases. They were in the context of uh, opposite sex relationships, uh, but it really resonated with me that maybe there's an argument for kids of same-sex couples uh, to have a place. 
Um, and so when this came along in the DOMA context, uh, it just dawned on us that, you know, there's actually a fit here, even though we're talking about marriage. And actually, I think the protection claim might, might be stronger. Uh, because you're talking about identically situated kids. If, if you have a same-sex couple with a kid in, in uh, Connecticut, where their parents can get married, and an opposite sex couple uh, uh, with a kid uh, in Connecticut, both the parents are married. And what the federal government is saying, sorry, kid with the uh, same-sex uh, married parents, we're not going to give you, your family doesn't get federal benefits. So they're identically situated. So in some ways, it makes it a stronger uh, argument. So I'm just going to talk briefly about the history of DOMA. So in 1996, Congress, fearful that Hawaii might allow same-sex marriage, would quickly protect the country from a, quote, orchestrated assault being waged against traditional heterosexuals. <laughs> um, Congress's anticipatory defense of parity, the Defense of Marriage Act, codified the federal definition of marriage as a legal, legal union between one man and one woman. And this is kind of unheard of, right? The federal government usually doesn't delve into the definition of marriage or family law. That's usually left to the states. Uh, so now, uh, percolating through, we end up with Windsor, uh, uh, the Supreme Court will decide whether DOMA's exclusion of lawfully married same-sex couples from federal rights and benefits is unconstitutional. So Edith Windsor uh, and Tia Spire, Thea Spire, were a couple for 44 years. Okay, I think there should be an exemption right here. <laughs> if you have somebody for 44 years, I would give it, I would give it, you get benefits. <laughs> marriage equality state that had recognized their Canadian marriage. Uh, nevertheless, DOMA prohibited Edith from claiming a federal estate tax exemption for widows, forcing her to pay uh, $363,000. Um, and of course, this is what's being challenged. Uh, there were several other federal benefits cases that had percolated up. This one was the one the court decided to accept cert in. A lot, lots of topics, Family Medical Leave Act, a federal health insurance for federal employees. I mean, you name it. And it's just going to keep keep percolating um, uh, over time, I think, uh, unless the, the Supreme Court uh, strikes them down. Uh, the Southern District of New York held that DOMA violates the Equal Protection Clause under rational basis review, sidestepping this heightened classification steps that you saw. Um, and uh, the Second Circuit affirmed the District Court, but did also decide to go ahead and wade into the classifications debate and found that uh, sexual orientation warranted heightened scrutiny. Uh, finding gays, that gays and lesbians have suffered a history of discrimination, uh, that they have the ability to contribute to society. Thank you for that. There's an insular minority, uh, and that was dovetailed with the immutability requirement, um, and that gays and lesbians are politically powerless. Uh, so the court concludes that not only, even if heightened classification, uh, so the, the test, you know, essentially they're saying that uh, uh, the justifications by the government failed uh, heightened review. They also said that it, uh, it would fail on a rational basis as well. Um, and so the rationales, I'm going to skip straight to the rationales. I, my guess is that the court's probably not going to add do a heightened classification. I would be surprised. Uh, that would be great if they did find that gays and lesbians were uh, uh, subject to heightened review. I, I have a suspect on that. I just don't think they're going to do something that changes all of the, the entire country. Uh, nationally or federally. I think they're going to continue to make the states kind of percolate on this issue. Uh, so there's several rationales that the, uh, in the briefs that Blag, uh, or Blog, however we're pronouncing it, um, argues. And I'm going to go through them briefly and then talk about the one we really focused on, uh, although uh, probably might have to do. Um, so first, government preserves each sovereign's ability to define marriage itself. Uh, DOMA, these are the justification rationale for why DOMA is uh, constitutional. Uh, DOMA ensures national uni uniformity for federal benefits and programs based on marital status. Uh, DOMA conserves financial resources. And then the big one that I think really is the primary justification, although they totally didn't talk about it at all in the Supreme Court arguments, um, uh, and I'll we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, the primary justification is the focus of our brief, which is that um, Heterosexual marriage must be preserved in order to protect children. Um, and uh, as the reasoning goes, as Professor Polvo uh, referenced, if same-sex couples are granted the right to marry, 
heterosexual couples who could have children biologically and often by accident, something same-sex couples can't do. Um, <laughs> they will disassociate marriage from child rearing. Uh, and these allegedly irresponsible rank and file heterosexuals will no longer be incentivized to marry, <laughs> subjecting their children to harmful economic and social consequences. So basically what the government is saying is they have a plan for all the heterosexuals, I'm just saying. Uh, <laughs> and they're also saying that denying same-sex couples marriage incentivizes straight people to do it responsibly <laughs> and within the bounds of marriage. <laughs> now I want you to percolate on that. <laughs> think about that. Uh, if you make this connection for me, please let me know. <laughs> I'm trying to figure this one out for a while. I still have not gotten a good uh, connection on this one. Um, and the reality is that a lot of scholars and jurists have persuasively shown the flaws in this kind of preservation of heterosexual marriage and child rape justification, uh, even under rational basis review. Um, the government has yet to offer a logical link between uh, the legal exclusion of married same-sex couples from federal benefits and the more responsible uh, different sex sexual practices or marriage. Um, but the focus of our uh, brief is not about that, but on the not on the perspective from married uh, same-sex couples, but instead from the perspective of kids of same-sex couples. Um, and uh, you know, for a number of reasons, I think kids have been. Uh, left out of the debate in a lot of ways um, and out of the legal battleground, but uh, they suffer far greater injury from DOMA than the abstract and lacking in causal connection reported harm to heterosexual couples and their children. Um, so the flaw in the government's argument, and you don't see any reference to this in the congressional record or in DOMA about the children of same-sex couples, or the children of, of single gays and lesbians, there's no discussion. Um, according to the United States Census, 28% uh, of cohabiting same-sex couples are raising at least one child under the age of 18. Um, of these, it's estimated that between 300,000 to 1 million children are being raised by same-sex couples. Uh, the remainder, another million or so, are being raised by single gays and lesbians. Um, and contrary to popular stereotype, uh, children being raised by same-sex same couples are twice as likely to live in poverty as children being raised by married heterosexual household, in married heterosexual households. And they're also more likely to be children of color. Um, uh, same-sex couples of color are raising children at a much higher rate than white same-sex couples. And this is often a, a statistic that people are surprised by. Um, and we can talk about that. I have lots of theories about that. Um, but, uh, and, and that's something I think that we should be talking about and fleshing out uh, more. So as for the children of families specifically excluded uh, by Section 3 of DOMA, while there's no consensus on the exact numbers, it's estimated that one-third of same-sex couples in marriage states are raising children. Um, and obviously these, these numbers are likely to increase as more states extend the institution of marriage to include their gay and lesbian um, residents. Uh, so we talk about in the brief two ways that uh, children are harmed by, um, uh, by DOMA. The first being uh, the economic injury uh, loss of economic benefits into the household for kids of same-sex married parents. Um, uh, so kids in marriage equality states, essentially, uh, their households are uh, being denied the 1,100 federal marital rights and benefits. Uh, and as I said, I referenced earlier, that means federal leave, federal Family Medical Leave Act, uh, federal health insurance. So all those resources that their parents aren't getting uh, um, are being denied the kids in those households as well in terms of access to those to those benefits. Um, and it's beyond an argument that children of married and same-sex couples have the same interest in the family security and stability uh, in the married household that DOMA purports to be providing to the fear of, of the kids who are being produced accidentally and outside the bounds of marriage uh, losing that stability. So, um, uh, you know, it, it really is, puts on, it's really clear because the government's saying, no, your household can't have these benefits um, uh, here. So, um, and, and the thing about it is also, we talked about this in a brief, is that denial of these protections is not a one-time injury. Uh, it's rather the denial of the course, over the course of the child's <coughs> lifetime, uh, and it's cumulative, um, and really does, if you buy the government's argument, disrupt, disrupt one of the uh, primary functions of the family unit, which is to provide stability 
uh, for future generations. And we can debate about that. Um, I'm not the biggest marriage advocate necessarily, but we're really meeting the, the parties squarely on their own arguments, uh, essentially. Um, and then in the brief, we also talk about children of all same-sex families, and we kind of raise a stigma argument. Um, we say that in addition to the direct legal and economic injuries uh, inflicted on children within uh, same-sex married parents, DOMA also inflicts a psychological harm by symbolically expressing the inferiority of families headed by, by same-sex parents and the children in those families. Um, and uh, so we talk about the stigma and we reference briefly um, a number of cases. We talk about uh, Brown v. Board and Palmari v. Sinati and um, a number of cases that talk about uh, um, uh, stigma and uh, you know a message of inferiority, which there is that theme in line within the Equal Protection Clause. Um, so essentially, the legal arguments for all this kind of lie in this non-marital status cases, and so I'm going to talk about those briefly. Um, and implicates, because it all really implicates the court's lengthy history of protecting children against such unfair discrimination that we kind of laid out in the brief. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about these non-marital status cases. You've got the list of the cases up here. Um, and uh, so we have a non-marital status case, Levy and Weber, and then Plyler um, uh, is the um, undocumented immigrants case. Um, so we'll talk with you about those. And then I want to kind of stop and, and open it up for, for questions. Um, so the Supreme Court has consistently expressed special concern with discrimination against children. Um, this concern is perhaps most strongly expressed in the court's treatment of non-marital children. Um, and so for those that know, the United States has had a long history of discrimination against kids born outside of marriage uh, uh, because of society's moral combination uh, of their parents' conduct. And so they were denied legal and social benefits. Uh, they should not inherit property. Uh, they were not entitled to financial uh, support, wealth and death recovery, workers' compensation, social security, and other government benefits just because their parents were born out, uh, just because they were born outside of marriage. Um, the first case, Levy versus uh, Louisiana, uh, was the first equal protection challenge brought in 1968 uh, on behalf of non-marital children. Uh, Louise Levy was an unmarried African-American mother with five young children. She died uh, as a result of medical malpractice in a state hospital. Um, her sister sues on behalf of her children uh, and they, because they were prohibited from recovery under the equivalent of a wrongful death statute. Um, and uh, in a groundbreaking political victory, the United States Supreme Court reversed the lower Louisiana Supreme Court that, that said it was permissible to discriminate against these kids. And here's why. They said, you know, it's okay to discriminate against these kids insofar as morals and general welfare discourage bringing children into the world out of wedlock. Sound familiar? Um, and so the United States Supreme Court said, no, this is impermissible discrimination. You're not going to, you can't have you treating these kids differently um, just because you uh, disagree with their parents' conduct. Um, and the, the next case after that, probably really the case, which is Weber, um, and I'm going to give you the facts of Weber just so you have, a, have an idea of it. So four years after Levy, um, in Weber, the court struck another blow to government conduct that penalizes children based off the moral disdain of their parents' conduct or relationship. Uh, Henry Clyde Stokes died of work-related injuries. At the time of his death, his wife, Willie Mae Weber, um, uh, he, he lived with, sorry, at the time of his death, he lived with Willie Mae Weber. Um, Stokes and Weber were not married, but had five children. Uh, one of the children was born to Stokes uh, and Weber, while, while four of the others had been born to Stokes and his lawful wife had been committed to a um, uh, mental institution. Um, and so the four marital children after Stokes' death filed for workers' compensation <coughs> benefits um, and received those benefits. The children born outside of the marriage, the two kids, now keep in mind these are all these kids within the same household. Um, ended up being denied the workers' compensation benefits because they were not marital children. Um, and the Supreme Court, once again, reversed. These, are all out, these cases are all out of Louisiana. Uh, I think we should look for a kid's case in Louisiana or Alabama, one of these states. Um, uh, so the Supreme Court reverses um, and articulates the principle that is now well established in equal protection. Treating children born outside of marriage uh, differently than those born inside it is impermissible discrimination. Um, and uh, so 
that really was our, our focus in the brief was to talk about how kids of same-sex couples, same-sex married couples in the context of DOMA are identically situated to kids of opposite sex married couples. Um, and, and what we talked about was, even though it's not a non-marital status case, the general principles still apply, right? Even though you can't say it's discrimination on the, on the basis of marriage, because they're both kids in marriage families, the general principles apply that what the government is doing is withholding federal benefits because they disagree with the kid's parent relationship. And the court says, you know, you can't do that. Uh, and, and that equal protection jurisprudence is really sound and solid in that respect. That you can't punish the kids just because you uh, disagree with what's going on with the parents. Um, so uh, we spent a pretty good amount of time talking about this, and we talked about the concept of these cases, including Plyler. Um, uh, but I want to just take one second to talk about one other argument that we focus on as well. Um, and and Plyler really, the language of Plyler really reinforces this idea that, you know, you can't punish a kid because they have no control over their parents' conduct. Really fascinating for those of you that are doing uh, equal protection law right now or talking about constitutional law, because everybody knows that immutability requirement. Everybody thinks the immutability requirement is about race. And it does come, obviously, from our history of equal protection and racial discrimination and slavery and all those sorts of things. But a lot of the discussion from the non marital status cases really formulate uh, the immutability component of equal protection law. Um, it's kind of this lost history, I think, in some ways, when we're talking about immutability. You can't, uh, all of those cases are citing Weber. Cooling Brown uh, uh, cites Weber, cites these, these cases, uh, which is really interesting. You can't punish someone because of, uh, they have no control over the conduct. Uh, the, the other one I want to show about is that we also talked about briefly that there also is this gender discrimination taking place. Um, that really what's going on here, what's at fun is that it's about gender too. Um, so our, uh, this, this line, and how is it about gender? Well, it's saying that two men uh, or two women can't raise a kid. Uh, and it's conflation of conception and parenting, right? Uh, but yes, you, you may need a, you need a man and a woman to, to conceive a kid uh, in terms of biologically speaking, uh, but do you need a man and a woman in terms of parenting? And that's what they say in the briefs. The, the, the arguments are that, well, you need a man and a woman and a lot of these labels used to be a lot worse, uh, but it seems like they're trying to clean it up a little bit. And so, you know, in the briefs they say stuff like, you know, men and women have different tone and style and inflection. I mean, you gotta read it. It's like, it's wild. Um, and, and so, uh, we, that means that we should be able to uh, prevent two men and two women. You have to have a man and a woman. Uh, so what they're saying, there are inherent qualities in men and women that are unique, uh, that are incomplete without, in terms of raising this kid. And so, I, I, I'm really curious about this. So I guess they're saying that, you know, a woman can't show a kid how to do a downhill tackle. Um, a man can't nurture uh, or cook dinner, perhaps. Um, and remember that we already have been here, right, with heightened we know that gender is, it has heightened protection. And we know that the court has already said in lots of cases that gender stereotyping is impermissible. Like you can't deny benefits or uh, treat women and men differently based off just gender stereotypes. Um, and so I always joke, like, you know, this question about parenting, uh, do you think that my daughter is any more fearful when she's in trouble and I say, wait till I get home. I think she's thinking, oh man, at least it's not a dude. <laughs> 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 I don't have to pat my pants. Oh good, it's just, it's just my mom. But, <laughs> it's all um, but you know, these are the types of things that like, I think you know, we talk about uh, in theory, but also in practice. Um, when we're thinking about the arguments that are being made. I mean, a lot of these gender stereotype arguments were kind of, you know, talked about in this theoretical, co theoretical concept, and, and they're showing up in these arguments, and it's really been fleshed out. Like, no, you can't engage in gender stereotyping in making these sorts of decisions and decide to deny an entire group of, of people benefits. So um, I'm going to stop here. Let's hear questions and hear what you guys have to say about uh, this. I do have to say that it was really fun working on this brief with Professor Polo. Uh, and to have somebody who is not only a great theorist, but also an unbelievable practitioner, 
And this is the classic like Colorado practitioner <laughs> thing, right? So I'm, it's Thursday, the breeze through Monday. I'm like in the office, like in my office, my little stand up desk, bring it out. I call Lola, she's like on the slopes. <laughs> Like would you know write this like, would redraft whatever I wrote like in two seconds and send it back to me and we don't do another one uh, but uh, it was really fun and uh, it was great. And, yeah. and I think in general we realized that the value of bringing our scholarship yeah. to yeah. a case that's actually pending before the court um, and just one little last recap I wanted to, to make on um, Professor Smith's discussion of the briefs. There's not another brief out there like this. I think we're really proud of that fact. I mean, there are people are so kind of set in their ways, in a sense, and arguing about marriage equality. And when you were thinking about these cases, non marital status cases, we are kind of a lost history. And then looking at this very clear message that they sent and bringing that to the amicus brief, um, it was exciting. It was a really exciting opportunity. So, questions, thoughts, comments? So is it going to be the logical link here? Yeah. Good question. So we were talking about in the Windsor, no, was it the Windsor? The Doma case. No, 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 the Prop 8 case, sorry. Uh, Kennedy brought up the yeah. interests of the children, yeah. which, you know, is totally related to this during the oral arguments. How do you think the court can open up marriage to people in California, given the whole thing with children, and ignore the rest of the states? Like, what kind of argument can they They, sh they should ignore the rest of the states, in my opinion. Well, that's what's going to happen. Which, it's, it might be a controversial view, but I think that um, the, if the court, and I, I think the court will avoid reaching uh, a decision that will have implication for all 50 states. Because then, even though people may agree that that's the right outcome, there is a value in terms of legitimacy to the states who have out democratically. Um, to the point where, you know, if you read Proposition 8, and the courts have taken to meet their quality of the state, and you have what is really this kind of backlash um, deprivation of rights, you know, then the Supreme Court can come in and say that goes too far, that violates equal protection. But the, um, the situation in each of the states is a little different in terms of how the various laws are enacted, and uh, you know, the court wants to make room. Yeah, for people well, to figure this out. Well, also remember that in Perry, they were really interested about the word marriage. I mean, in Cal, this is one of my my pet peeves that we're putting so many resources into California um, when so much of the rest of the country has nothing, um, and we're talking about work um, because gays and lesbians in California get every right and benefit except for term marriage essentially. Um, and I'm not saying that's like menial, but the reality is that the kids in California that have same-sex parents are getting a, well, they're, they're not being denied benefits. Uh, they're being, uh, you know, maybe by DOMA in the federal sense, but, but, and so I think that uh, ultimately the court's probably just going to either punt it, they're going to dig it, or they're going to uh, find some outstanding and send it back to, and it's just, just going to be California marriages are just going to resume in California. They're going to find it, you know, because the district court and the court of appeals found that it was unconstitutional. So if they do that, it just limits it really to California for the most part. And there's, 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 um, the way the court would decide this, that would only decide California, but that, create the rule of law that could be accessed in other states. So we don't want the court necessarily make a blanket decision either way, I think, at this point. Um, just for, you know, judicial restraint and, and allowing the law to develop a little bit. There's some what we saw you again. So, Professor Smith, when you were talking about the reasoning behind them saying it's better to have an heterosexual couple, they're only using, I guess, positive things the difference between a man and a woman and why that is good for that child. Right. Are there any studies that show the negative part of it? You know, abandonment, sexual abuse, just child abuse, um, you know, abusive behavior from the man to the kids, you know, the, the scariness from having a father that's angry or alcoholic or something. And maybe compare that to show, well, is it really better or not? Yeah. Um, I think that you're hitting on the heart of something that's really important, you know, because uh, there's not that discussion going on because it, apparently if you're heterosexual, you're perfect. <laughs> um, I mean, really, that's literally, there is no interrogation of heterosexual parenting at all. There's no interrogation of it. Um, there's no question about it. There is no, well, what about heterosexual parenting? And, I mean, and also, what would you compare it to might be the question. 
Uh, just the reverse, there are studies that say, hey, uh, same-sex parents or lesbians raising kids, the kids turn out great or turn out okay. Kind of re you know, there's that sort of stuff. And you're like, oh, that's good. Because all of us, like most of us, might view ourselves as sort of screwed up and raised by heterosexuals, right? <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, myself included. Uh, so I think that, that is the, it's kind of like the invisibility of, of, of presumed confidence almost of heterosexuality. And that's true in all categories. That's true for whiteness. That's true for any majority group. The norm is invisible, right? The norm is invisible and, there's, and then everybody else is compared in relation to that norm. And the, the norm never gets interrogated as to whether it's good, bad, uh, neutral. No, there's never an interrogation in that way of the norm. Um, and that's, what, that's something that, that, you know, it's just presumed. And now you have a, go, sorry, but now you have another group to which you can compare it to. And there's statistics in all of this, abandonment views, you know. So why not start with that? They will. I mean, I think there. If politically it's not feasible, yeah. I think you can't attack heterosexuality yeah. and really yeah. expect to win in the courts. I mean, yeah. it'd be interesting academic project. It would be very dangerous politically. Um, and uh, they, they wouldn't, I think most folks wouldn't think that there's a causal connection between yeah. the, the abuse and the fact that it's a heterosexual couple. Right. right. That's and at the end of the day, is that really, I, I just don't know if that's the question. You know, I don't know if that's the issue. I think it does raise an interesting question about the norms and those sorts of things. but. At the end of the day, um, I don't know if it's, you know, gets you that far down the road, but it is an interesting question. Yeah. Uh, I'll scroll, I'll scroll. Uh, two things. One, can you talk a little bit, um, Chief uh, Justice uh, Cockroach, I mean Scalia said, <laughs> he said in oral arguments that there, was, that there was disagreement, and this kind of goes to the last, last comment, about whether or not parents of like same-sex parents are actually good parents, right? Yeah. So I wanted to hear kind of your perspective on that. And then secondly, best case scenario, they strike down DOMA, but what, what do you all think is gonna be, you know, just, just talking about Windsor. I've, I've kind of read that the commentary folks are kind of mixed in their reactions about the practical implications of that. Yeah, it sounds good on its face, but what is that gonna look like for military couples who are jumping jurisdictions and get married in one place and go somewhere else and like, you know, kind of what's your interpretation of this? Justice Scalia, um, a jurist that I am very interested in, um, <laughs> is totally off base with that comment, and here's why. Um, going back to Palmer versus Sadati, this is not a factual inquiry into who is, and this kind of relates back to your point, who is and who is not a competent parent. That's not the undertaking here. The inquiry is whether, as a matter of law, one can, um, determine legal rights based on moral disapproval of a certain parenting arrangement. So I think that, you know, <coughs> the, the court shouldn't be trying to delve into those malleable scientific sort of sociological issues. It's a matter of law, it's clearly established in the precedent. That's my response. Yeah. And I also just think that they're mixed. Even the social science, yeah, that big debate is just going to rage on. I mean, I think most of it is saying that they're, they're not any worse than heterosexual parents. But, um, but I think that it's, it's, you're always going to have some social science data that comes out the other way because everybody's got their own agenda around it. Um, and so I think it's difficult to glean for a lot of you know, people what that really means. Um, so it's not like there's, there's going to be this uh, definitive answer for the people who want to find one way or the other. Uh, particularly, I think that they're bad parenting, but I think as compared to what um, is, is the hard part. The other thing is um, the consequences. Oh yeah, the consequences. I think that, uh, but that just opens it up for more litigation. Right. I just think that's the bottom line. Like, so that's going to open it up to have some of these jurisdictional challenges. You're not going to keep one soldier in Kansas differently than in Connecticut, right? So you got to strip that away before yeah. you even get at those issues. Yeah, so you, you got to strip it away yeah. before you can even start that process. Go ahead, Scott. All right, I remember this one for it. Right. <laughs> yeah, question for you. you. Mentioned earlier that people of color uh, tend to have. Uh, same-sex people of color tend to have more kids than a non, than a basically non-people of color. Yeah. White people. Of color. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> well, I guess my question is. I love that. I do too. But, uh, my question is, like, what's basically uh, the whole idea of um, like, where, where, how, what's the phenomenon that's responsible for that? Um, you know, it's a good question. I think that a lot of the data, you know. <clears throat> a lot of the data is that, um, and it's, it's high, like the same-sex uh, 
of color, like lesbian, black lesbians, like 50% uh, have like uh, kids, and for Latinas, it's, it's higher than that. You, you know, um, I think it's just about uh, uh, one of the things is that it's kids from previous heterosexual relationships, okay. um, and so it's definitely things of the gay people that bring us this, um, uh, you know alternative summation or, you know, surrogacy. The reality is probably a significant percentage of kids being raised by people who are identified as gay and lesbian and by couples come from previous uh, heterosexual relationships. Um, and also for the, for of color, they're finding that the gays and lesbians of color are raising their family members' kids. Um, and so there's a lot of social factors that are at play in terms of how the numbers are higher and look different. Uh, um, I think all of our textbook cases on standing have to do with standing of the challenger. But if they if they take this on standing of the people defending the law and say there's no standing, mm -hmm. then where does that leave the laws? Are they uh, are they valid or not? It refers back to uh, for. They'll be different for the different ones, right? For Perry versus Windsor. Is there a, a circuit conflict? There is uh, not, no, not in Windsor. I'm sorry, not with the Defense of Marriage Act, but I don't, I mean, I don't not necessarily fully really qualified to answer this question. Um, but my understanding is that it would revert to whatever the state of the law is prior to the loss of standing. So the district court. Yeah, the yeah district that's why the district, district court, court the district court, for, for Perry, the district court opinion would be. Uh, the law, um, because then they would have had standing at the uh, Ninth Circuit. So it goes all the way back to either scenario, uh, marriage is going to start again, resume again, if it goes out on the standing issue for uh, Perry. For Windsor, um, I don't think it, I don't think it matters. It would still be the lower courts also same thing. The lower court found that right. Yeah. So I don't think it changes it. that. It would open the door. I mean, they, there is a process by which certain Congress members could be authorized to defend uh, the law in another case yeah. before the Supreme Court. So it could be kind of next chapter. And it's so oppressive. I mean, that in the posture that Windsor is in in terms of standing issues. First of all, my head was going to explode. I actually went, made it into an argument. I didn't get into the actual oral argument itself. I stood in line over there at 4.30 in the morning and stood in line um, and uh, got into the lower, for Supreme Court bar admitted lawyers, there's an overflow room. Um, and uh, sitting there listening to those arguments, it was just like impossible. I mean, nobody really, everybody was just, just floundering. Um, and you're talking about all the people in the, like, the gay rights movement um, in that room and everybody was just like, what the heck? And that's why they had Nikki Jackson this Harvard Law professor, they, the court asked her to do the argument because it's just so unprecedented. People just don't, you know, they don't know, really. So she's obviously yeah. awesome, right? So she's a professor at Harvard Law School, and then the court's like, can you please come to us? <laughs> and tell us, please, the case, yeah. 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 Argue yeah. with us. Yeah. That's, really, that's really unusual and, and pretty impressive. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you. It was hard. If you're ever thinking about trying to get to the arguments, uh, I got there at 4.30 in the morning, and they had already had, like, I don't know, people had started the day before, but it's really interesting. It's like uh, all these lawyers are paying homeless people to squat. You have to pay for a and you just worry. Like, you're like, really? How, like, this is our, the best of the best? Like, you're going to pay some poor person. They pay them a lot. It's like a thousand bucks. So there were some students doing it too. <laughs> but, uh, but it was like, literally, these people pulled their limos and get out of their vehicle and swap out with these, with these people who were like sleeping there overnight uh, and, you know, pay them or whatever. It was horrible. Um, it was more, it was like so, I don't know, morally, I just felt like, I don't know. Uh, and then, of course, all the lawyers of mine were pissed. They were really <laughs> unhappy about that, that they stood up there, you know. Like, so it was impossible to get into actual oral argument itself on the, in the courtroom, in the Supreme Court, because unless you're going to pay $1,000 and compromise your own moral values, I guess, to have somebody, you know, sleep there. Um, 
So yeah, so that, you know, just keep that in mind if you're ever trying to get you in. Know, there's a public line and there's a Supreme Court bar admitted line. Um, and uh, both lines are basically at this point paying people basically to, to stand in line. And they, I went the day before and the line had already started at like 12, in the, 12 or 1 o'clock in the afternoon. So, um, you know, so I said, okay, I can do 4 30 in the morning. That's about as much as I'm going to get. If not, I'll watch it from a bar or something. And so, you guys, um, you, you heard that the opinions are like coming out late too. Yeah. yeah. If you haven't looked at SCOTUS Blog, SCOTUS Blog is a great source for all of you with our industry. Yeah, all of the um, filings of the cases, audio and transcripts of oral arguments, and they live blog the release of opinions. So, when they release that, also the Fisher case is important. Affirmative yeah. action cases yeah. coming up soon, so it's a good, a good yeah. resource. And if any of you are writing papers about this in your class, I know I have a group of students that are my class, uh, if you're writing papers about this right now, don't just take it and put it on a shelf uh, after you're done. Take it and try and get it published because the law reviews are going to be looking for articles as soon as these opinions come out. Um, and just don't let all that hard work uh, go to waste. I know you think, well, who wants to hear my opinion? Well, you know what? Uh, your opinion and what you're saying is valuable and important, and you should put it out there. Uh, you'll regret it 10 years from now, I think, if you don't. And you already have, you've already done the work on it. So just push a little bit more. Talk to Pope and I about that, um, about you know how you get it finalized to do a public so you actually send it out to our reviews. But I hope you do so because it's, it, it'll be there and, and people will. Really <coughs> All right. Well, thank you guys.